For many platformers that have been around as long as Kirby has, many experimented with 3D gameplay as soon as the technology allowed it. It gave way to a whole new era for the platformer genre. However, despite its peers all taking that leap, the furthest Kirby ever dared to go was 2.5, if even that. And that's how it's been. For its entire existence, Kirby has been one of the last older platformers to remain a mostly 2D series, at least when it comes to the mainline games. So now that HAL finally decided to bring Kirby into a whole new dimension, will it have learned from the successes and failures of others who made the transition? Well, spoiler alert, the answer is a resounding yes. Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and here we are. I can't wait to tell you all about Kirby in the Forgotten Land. Taking nearly 30 years of side-scrolling platformers and translating that over to 3D is no easy task. There's a lot to consider, from keeping the core feeling of the series intact to also modifying practically all existing mechanics for a 3D space. After all, modern copy abilities are pretty much built around being in 2D with the various directional inputs that make up their arsenal. Like it or not, bringing them into a 3D space will require those movesets to be significantly modified. And while that could easily lead to the resulting 3D incarnations of them being inferior, I feel Hal did a pretty Pretty great job of tackling such a challenge. As despite pretty much every ability brought over from past games losing attacks, nearly all the changes work in the game's favor. Keep in mind, in a 3D space, any attacks that require the dash or anything with the vertical buttons can't really be brought over. Kirby's always dashing in the game for one, and what used to be the vertical buttons are now used for moving around in all directions. However, that's not to say all moves tied to those would be lost forever. Take Sword for instance, it's one of the very first copy abilities in the series that's gone through numerous changes over the years. To maintain its classic moveset along with accommodating for not being able to tie moves to the vertical buttons anymore, Hal ended up squeezing the upward slash in as a combo action of sorts. And that's just the base form of sword. We'll talk about the other forms later, believe me. Now granted, this isn't the same for every ability as most only have a few moves, though even then, I feel like they all work pretty well. Like Needle, pretty much all it can do in its base form is its basic spike attack or a dash if you do it in the air while moving. The special thing about it in 3D is now, the ability can move around as more enemies get attached to it. This becomes incredibly satisfying as the more things you pick up, the faster and longer you can move around with spikes out. And best of all, this can translate to picking up stars in battles too, any objects you pick up getting sent out as an extra attack when you release the spikes. Even with Needle having a few more attacks in recent Kirby games, that change alone makes it my favorite rendition of the ability. It's not alone either. In Forgotten Land, Cutter went from an ability that I usually ignore in a normal Kirby to one of my favorites. The combination of you being able to rapid-fire cutters with strategically holding one in the field to get the enemy when they least expect it, practically created a whole new way to fight. Without a doubt, Hal chose to go the quality over quantity route when it came to 3D abilities, and I'm really glad they did. Seeing that they brought Tornado over was one of the highlights of my playthrough, as it truly was meant for 3D. Even Kirby staples like Ice and Fire would receive notable changes, as when you use them against bosses, they apply increasingly stronger status effects the more you attack. That alone made Fire one of my all-time favorites in Forgotten and land. Although with ice, while the freezing effect is cool, I do still wish they would have brought back its aerial move as I don't see why it couldn't have worked in 3D. It's a really minor gripe, all things considered. Then in the two new abilities Hal created with Ranger and Drill, they're both incredibly fun. In terms of Ranger, it quickly became one of my go-to abilities for the entire game all the way up to its hardest fights. It's so satisfying landing charge shots whenever you can. Drill is great too as it's the closest thing we've gotten to Animal in ages, but to me, it's more of an environmental ability like Wheel. Don't get me wrong, you can absolutely take it into any fight with its ability to stay underground for a while and trigger attacks by digging in circles, it's just when it came to my playthrough I prefer taking other abilities into fights. Like Hammer for instance, which returns in all of its hard-hitting glory, much of its moveset remaining untouched for the most part. Same goes for Bomb, whose ability to throw bombs in every direction was way more fun than I expected. Not counting Crash and Sleep, those are all the abilities Forgotten Land has to offer. If that really was it, things could get a bit stale once you've gotten used to them all, so to prevent that from happening, Forgotten Land took a page out of Squeak Squad's book of all things. That's right, much like Flagship's final Kirby game, Forgotten Land allows you to upgrade abilities when you get their corresponding ability scrolls and stages. While I can't really go into many of these permanent upgrades before I dive into the story, believe me when I say this mechanic is one of the absolute best things in the game. Despite some upgrades only coming with minor changes like increased damage or range, many of the later ones reinvent the abilities in ways I never 
never could have expected. Though again, I'll hold off on completely gushing about them until a bit later. Believe it or not, that isn't even my favorite change when it comes to how Kirby defends himself, because above all that, there's perfect dodges. Now normally, Kirby dodges were an already useful mechanic where if you move while guarding right before you're hit with an attack, you can usually avoid taking any damage at all. The same is true for dodging in Forgotten Land, only here, you can of course dodge in all directions. However, that's where the similarities end, because on top of dodging being a larger action that has Kirby somersaulting out of the way, if you do it in the specific span of time right before an attack hits you, you'll trigger a perfect dodge. Clearly, having played Bayonetta in the span of time between Star Allies and Forgotten Land, if you manage to pull off a perfect dodge, time slows down, granting various benefits. On one hand, you can use the opportunity to dodge again to put distance between yourself and the enemy. Though even better, if you attack right when time slows down, you'll perform a counterattack, this action varying depending on the ability you have. Once you get the hang of this, you can straight up perform these back to back in quick succession if the enemy keeps attacking you. Meaning with every perfect dodge, if you time everything correctly, you can also squeeze in a counter every time, making for a whole new engaging way to take down bosses. Now of course, there are plenty of times when countering isn't as feasible depending on your ability or what the boss is doing, but it's still one of my favorite ways to deal damage. Not to mention for later fights, it becomes practically essential, so you'd better get the hang of it sooner rather than later. I'd go so far to say that perfect dodges are one of my all-time favorite Kirby mechanics ever. My timing isn't always the best, but pulling off those counters can be so satisfying. Apparently, the slowdown can also be triggered if Kirby slides or flies right before an enemy hits him. Never really did that in-game though, as I preferred dodging way more. Plus, alongside that, you do always have the option to float over attacks as well. Except with Hal taking away the air dodge and limiting how long Kirby can float, I only utilized it in fights when absolutely necessary. So needless to say, the combat of Forgotten Land is probably my favorite in the whole series. Never would have thought that they'd nail it on their first try, and I haven't even gone into the game's gimmick yet. As with all modern Kirby games, Forgotten Land comes with its own unique gameplay gimmick in the form of the immediately infamous Mouthful Mode. Various levels of cursed designs aside, it's a neat little gimmick. Functioning somewhat like the Robobot armor in that Mouthful Mode acts as a new way for Kirby to overcome obstacles or solve puzzles, but also taking in some characteristics from the friend actions of Star Allies, it's a very unique gimmick. On one hand, the gimmick can solely be used for utility purposes, like moving stairs around or lighting up a dark room, though other times it can be incredibly active as you maneuver a car or boat around to destroy any obstacles in your path. Where I think Mouthful Mode truly shines is since it focuses on Kirby enveloping all sorts of objects, it gives the devs far more freedom to conjure up all sorts of crazy forms for the gimmick. Want Kirby to envelop a cone and use it to pierce all kinds of things? Go for it. Want Kirby to use an archway to glide through the air? I don't see why not. It's that lack of real limits to what can or can't qualify as a potential mouthful mode that really makes the gimmick what it is, at least from a design standpoint. From a gameplay standpoint, all the forms really grew on me more than I thought they would, the arch mouth definitely being my favorite due to the crazy segments they made for it. I really hope Kirby gimmicks continue with this trend of variety. If they ever made a gimmick that combined these aspects with the Robobot armor's characteristic of being an extension of Kirby's abilities, it'd make for the perfect gimmick. However, what makes all these gameplay mechanics truly reach their full potential is the fantastic stage design of Forgotten Land. I'm not exaggerating when I say that in terms of this game's levels, they all rank among some of the best, if not the best, I've ever seen in Kirby. Which is absolutely insane considering this is the first proper 3D Kirby platformer. Those many years of development were well spent, that's for sure. So in order for me to go into them all, I'll have to also go into the game's spoilers. If you haven't played the game yet, I highly implore you to amend that as soon as possible because this is a must for the Kirby series. You can come back to this point of the video after you beat the game. Thus, with that taken care of, let's dive into the rest this game has to offer. Starting with a positive before even hitting the game's intro cutscene, Forgotten Land surprised me with an actual difficulty selection. In the two options presented, there's an easier and harder mode that changes aspects of the game like how much health Kirby has and the difficulty of enemies among other things. This isn't exactly a new concept for Kirby as in the past, harder difficulties would be something you could unlock via the extra mode, but this is a much better way of going about it. I really hope this becomes a mainstay for the series from here on. The extra star coins that came with Wild Mode were definitely a must for me. So after getting the game properly set up, Forgotten Land hits you with the fruits of its long development with some of the best visuals seen in the series so far. And the crazy thing is, that's not something that's exclusive to the cutscenes either. In the actual 3D environments of the game, everything looks so great! From barely noticeable details like scratches on Meta Knight's mask to the nature overtaking buildings, you can't deny how pretty everything looks here. Though speaking of those buildings, let me address the abandoned civilization in the room. Much like how Kirby Planet Robobot adopted an encompassing 
encompassing mechanical theming to just about everything in its game, Forgotten Land takes on an entirely new theme, as instead of Popstar being mechanized, the world Kirby and friends get sucked into is host to what was once a massive civilization that's eerily similar to our own, pretty much every one of its levels containing the rotting remnants of said civilization. It's without a doubt the darkest setting for a Kirby game the more you think about it, because despite the bright, fun Kirby gameplay, there's a sense of sadness that permeates many of the environments you go through, with it being shown that whoever lived here had a fully functioning society in every aspect you can think of. That goes beyond all the long-forgotten structures, too. There's even full-on alien text throughout a great majority of the game. Alien text that, may I emphasize, is fully translatable into English. That's right, every time you see some alien text appear in this game, Hal went the extra mile to make sure it makes sense in the location. For instance, later on in the game, there's a stage that takes place inside a half-submerged frozen metro. Well, above the ticket booth at the metro's entrance, there's alien text that translates to tickets. And sure, they would get a bit cheeky with sneaking in some easter eggs, as I found out while translating things, but aside from that, pretty much all the text I've personally translated makes sense where it shows up. I've always applauded Hal for their attention to detail in games, but nothing compares to this. They deserve serious praise. But getting back on track, it's pretty surprising how well this world of deteriorating structures fits so well with Kirby. The creativity that went into so many of them made me forget half the time that I was exploring the remnants of an advanced civilization. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that accompanying it all is some of the best music Kirby's ever seen. And I mean that sincerely. I'll hold back from talking about it now until the dedicated portion of this video to the soundtrack, though believe me, there's so much. Truly Kirby can make any setting, no matter how dark, cheerful in some way. Can't wait for the next Kirby game to take place in an active war zone. So to match this great setting, Forgotten Land actually encourages you to explore these detailed locales with its take on collectibles. Now like all the modern Kirby games, in each stage, there's a set amount of collectibles for you to find. There's the primary collectible in the form of all the Waddle Dees you need to save, and the secondary collectible in the form of Gotcha Capsules. Partially due to it being so cute whenever you save them, these Waddle Dees are my favorite Kirby collectible ever by far, as all the ways you get them are so unique. It has a lot to do with the 3D gameplay providing more creative ways to hide them, but what's really cool this time around is you don't only get them by finding puzzle rooms or overcoming obstacles. Alongside all the methods you'd expect, you also get them by accomplishing specific goals set for each stage or boss. And with many of these goals requiring you to go around looking for subtle details like a side path in a stage or an object you need to interact with, it really makes you appreciate how detailed every stage is. They've definitely hidden collectibles well in the past, though it feels like they truly went all out here. What's better is if you inevitably miss a goal in the stage, beating it will reveal what it was, keeping subsequent runs from becoming too much of a pain. I will admit, with this new goal system, I did end up playing nearly every level twice to get everything, but I honestly didn't mind it. With how pretty and fun the stages of this game are, it never really got annoying to me. Plus, with the non-goal Waddle Dees you get, you can actually hear them when you're near one, which helped me out a ton. I know for sure I would have missed way more without that. And building off of how Return to Dreamland handled the spheres, these Waddle Dees actually come with a real effect in the game. Since after all this time that they never did this again, Forgotten Land brings in the Waddle Dee Village, where over time, the more you save, the more the village gets restored and populated. Unlocking things in the lore was already pretty cool, but this made me so much more motivated to get every Waddle Dee out there. It's so satisfying unlocking features like minigames or even a little restaurant this way. They better not make Waddle Dees back into enemies in the next Kirby game, I swear. My heart can't take it. Then with the gotcha capsules, these function pretty much exactly like the other secondary collectibles in modern Kirby, in that the figures you get from them are just something you can look at in your collection. Well, for the most part, because in actuality, these figures come with an added incentive for you to collect them. As I'm sure all the seasoned Kirby fans watching know, ever since Superstar Ultra, Kirby has been sneaking lore into the pause screens of battles. It's become a pretty big deal, so going into Forgotten Land, I was quite shocked to learn that now, pause screens have gone back to being just that. Pause screens. Not even copyability info is listed anymore. Now, to be fair, I do understand pause lore getting removed. It was kind of annoying when half the time you'd miss it due to being wrapped up in fights, though getting rid of copyability info was a step too far in my opinion. Sure, most of the abilities are pretty simple to grasp with many not having more than a couple attacks, but even older Kirby games that also didn't have very complex abilities showed you their attacks. Let it be known, I got by perfectly fine in this game without it, so it's not a really big gripe for me, it just felt a bit unnecessary. But don't fret, while lore has left the pause screen for good, it's found a new superior home in Gotcha. That's right, as if 100%ing the game wasn't enough motivation to get them all, and now certain Gotcha even come with lore. This, in my opinion, is far superior to pause screen lore, since not only can you see it whenever you get the right figures, Hal 
battle isn't limited to just making lore about the specific character you're battling anymore. With the freedom of gacha figures, HAL can add lore to anything at once, from bosses to set pieces found in the game. What's more, these aren't nearly as grindy compared to some of the other secondary collectibles. You can still get duplicates of the same figure in-game, but to offset that, you're also able to buy them from the gacha machines with the coins you collect. It's way better than having to siphon away your 3DS play coins. On top of all that, much later on, there's even Scalper D, who will trade you the figures you don't have. Though in my experience, you can easily get everything with the coins you get. All in all, a great mechanic. You know it's a good game when I've spent this long appraising its base mechanics. So going into the actual levels themselves, the first world of Forgotten Land does a good job of establishing the tone and setting of the game with its eroding cityscape. I always loved how despite entering mouthful mode, Kirby still has the hat of his copy ability on. He looks so goofy. It genuinely shocked me when the game pulled an ear with its opening song having actual singing using a fake language. Kirby vibing to the music will forever be a highlight of this game to me, though by far the best level of this world has to be the mall as I'm sure you'd all agree. Serving as this game's special themed stage like Robobot casino, the stage design of going around an abandoned overgrown mall was so nice. Everything from the Awoofies having meals to the restaurant puzzles were such a treat. I will admit, it did take me a second to get all the donuts though. And after you've gotten these first few levels done, I'm sure you've noticed some extra challenges popping up on the map. Well, in the spirit of Return to Dreamland, these are the spiritual successors to its challenge stages, some being hidden and others getting unlocked by getting Waddle Dees. Testing you on everything, from copy abilities to specific mouthful modes, these get decently harder the further in you get. Or if you've achieved maximum Kirby brain rod and intend to get all the time goals despite them not being necessary for completion, then these can become some of the hardest challenges in any Kirby game. With most being pretty short, they serve as a nice buffer between the longer fleshed out stages. Plus, the rare stones you get from them are very much worth it for ability upgrades. Then with the boss of the first world, this one wasn't as easy as I expected. Keeping up the trend started by the past few games of a solid first boss, Gorimondo is a surprisingly dynamic fight. He's not all that bad once you get the hang of it, of course, but his massive size can be pretty intimidating as he spins towards you. Despite most Kirby bosses being larger than Kirby, fighting them in 3D makes it feel like Kirby's up against a much stronger foe. I almost want to see a game like Superstar get remade in 3D. Those fights would be incredible. Did you dare to take his bananas? Anyways, onto the next world with its tropical-themed levels. I love how to keep the theming of the game, many of the levels take place in half-submerged water treatment plants. Learning that Tornado was both brought back and given a mini-boss to represent it was a massive shock having gone into this game knowing next to nothing. It's only fair that after all these years of cheesing levels with Tornado, Hal would conjure up a Tornado boss to cheese me in return. No joke, Florina sometimes gave me more trouble than the game's early bosses. A worthy successor to the last mini-boss that destroyed me. And just in general with this world, all the portions where you're swimming through the water looked so nice. The combination of old concrete and ocean isn't something you'd always think would look good, but it really does here. That boat you control with the ring mouth remains the one thing in this game I never completely got the hang of. It's definitely more of a me thing, but I could never quite predict when the controls would flip according to what direction you're going. Though out of the four stages here, I definitely liked the last one the most. From the fast-flowing rapids through the waterworks to being able to skate on the water with ice, it's a definite standout. So later with this world's boss, to my surprise, this game's Wispy Woods equivalent got promoted to being the second boss. He's still the easiest boss in the game, but Tropic Woods is an interesting take on Wispy Woods fights. By far the coolest addition to the classic wispy moveset here is his pseudo guard where he holds up a gate. His little tree goatee cracks me up. After that, this next world is where Forgotten Land really starts to change things up from the typical Kirby formula. For the most part, even in Robobot, Kirby levels tend to adhere to the same couple of environments. Well here, Hal took a look at the theme stages they've been making and decided to turn that into an entire world with the Wandaria Remains. Taking place inside a massive abandoned theme park that's still partially functioning surprisingly, if I hadn't already loved this game before, I certainly did now. Literally from the beginning of the first level it's already perfect, with the adorable mission of guiding some ducklings back to their mother. It doesn't get much cuter than that. Not to mention, the roller coaster mouth introduced here is a real close second to the arch mouth from earlier. I cannot stress how thankful I am that Hal lets you redo these in the stage itself. What a great decision. And while the racing level is a fun time, the latter two levels of this world are some of my favorites out of the entire game. The whole change of aesthetic in this House of Horrors stage is one of the best. Personally, 
it almost reminds me of this old glow-in-the-dark mini golf place I used to go to when I was younger. Well, that and laser tag, of course. It's a perfect opportunity to bring in the new and improved light bulb Kirby. Glad to see it back after all these years. Lastly, in the fourth level here, this one was such a joy to go through. As I've lived in Orlando, Florida pretty much all my life, I grew up going to the various theme parks around here. So to see a stage take on a nighttime setting with all the lights illuminating everything, it reminded me of Disney's electrical parade in a way, which honestly works so well with Kirby. What a great send-off to this wonderful world. Wandaria's boss, Claraline, is no pushover either. Her sending the internet into an uproar aside, this was the first fight of the game that actually got me to lose. And it was at this point where I finally realized that all this time, Forgotten Land had completely done away with lives. Dying still has the same effect of putting you back in the start of the area, it's just that instead of losing a life as a penalty, you lose a hundred coins. At a glance, this seems like a significant change, but honestly, it really isn't. Let's be real, when was the last time you beat a Kirby game without having a massive surplus in lives? For me, it's been ages. Lives definitely work in other series out there, they just don't really make a difference in Kirby. Alongside Claroline being a more challenging fight, this is also where I feel the game starts to encourage you much more to get used to dodging. You'll definitely want to for what's to come. Though before we get to the next world, there's a little something waiting for Kirby back at the Waddle Dee Village. To just about everyone's surprise, you actually unlock the arena in this game before beating it. The first boss rush inside doesn't have all the bosses, of course, but what it does have is none other than this game's Meta Knight fight. Where Claroline was one of the more active fights so far, Meta Knight fittingly kicks it up multiple notches, as I firmly believe this is the best fight with him in the series so far. It almost feels like 2D Kirby held Meta Knight back, because his aggressive fighting style truly feels at home in 3D. I really love how big the fighting arena is here, because it gives Meta Knight way more room to jump around the stage bombarding you with waves of attacks. Again, massive props to the talented people at HAL. I never would have thought that they'd nail a 3D Meta Knight fight this well on their first try. The quality doesn't stop there either, as in the fourth world, we continue the trend of spectacular stage design. Throughout this one's stages, we see Kirby exploring the half-submerged frozen remnants of what appears to be this world's equivalent of London. I'm sure I'm sounding a bit like a broken record at this point, but man, these stages look so nice. They really strike that fragile balance between beautiful and depressing as the stone city gets slowly eaten up by glaciers. It's a nice touch having the goal in the first stage be on the clock tower they play suspiciously close to the goal. It's as if the game is incentivizing you to take in the meticulously designed surroundings. Though this time, my favorite stage of this world is kind of a tie between the second and fourth stages. In any other Kirby game, this would be your typical frozen cave stage complete with falling ice hazards to impede you. Except through the lens of Forgotten Land, making that cave be a metro was such a neat idea. It's actually some somewhat accurate in terms of what happened in real life too, as if people suddenly vanished, all metros would eventually flood. Glad to see that alongside playing Bayonetta, Kirby also managed to squeeze in some Final Fantasy V with the obligatory mid-boss rush on a big bridge. Like how Robobot did it, the feral redesigns of classic mid-bosses are so cute. If only I could have had Kirby job change into a Mystic Knight, then I might have been able to beat those twin Frosties without taking damage on my first try. So now, whereas all the bosses until here have been pretty good, this was the first one to really get me to pop off. Because fittingly after a mid-boss rush, it's DDD time. Appearing to be possessed yet again for the millionth time, DDD is more powerful than ever due to Hal changing his design back to the peak roundness he had back in Kirby 64. Like Meta Knight, they did a great job bringing him over to 3D. It's so funny how the game wants you to steal his hammer. However, as great as all that is, that's not the real reason I love this fight so much. And I know, I said I'd hold back, but for this song in particular, I have to make an exception. Without a doubt, this this DDD theme is my favorite one of all time. It's incredibly high praise, I'm aware, it just goes so hard. Surpassing Planet Robobot's DDD, this one in particular is actually a remix of the DDD theme from Star Allies. Nice to know HAL is already pulling from that game for remix material. Though when it came to actually remixing it, they took what was already a groovy unique DDD theme and dismantled it entirely to build it back up as an incredible rock track. Complete with ample guitars, brass, and a pinch of violin, even the buildup of this song slaps so hard. Not to mention, there's the star of the song, DDD himself, whose chants throughout the theme elevate it to insane levels. I'm not sure if it's still Kumazaki voicing DDD, but I really hope it is, purely for the visual of him yelling in a recording booth for this track. When the core DDD theme kicked in, that's when this song won my heart forever. This bit that plays slightly after the main theme starts is frankly immaculate.
The way the main melody goes a bit slower than normal to allow all the clashes to punctuate each pause as the drum goes ham in the background is legendary. I guess I thought the same thing after Planet Robobot's rendition, but seriously, how will they be able to top this one? DDD vocals better become a staple in his themes from here on. Thus, moving on from that banger, Forgotten Land takes on a bit of an unexpected tone shift as DDD steals Elphalin and flies away to another continent. Starting the last third of Forgotten Land, at this point, the story has a much clearer direction with Kirby journeying to rescue Elphalin. Even the overworld theme changes to a much more ominous track. Gotta say, the name of the first stage here caught me pretty off guard when I initially got here. Of course, when I played the stage, I realized it meant where life began in terms of the stage being a dried out ocean, but it's still a wild name. What a cool setting too, it's absolutely one of the best desert stages they've made yet, with all the dead coral and shipping containers from a rusting ship strewn about. Any stage in this game like this that has larger, less linear locations for you to explore were where Forgotten Land really shined in my eyes. I hope they make more areas like this in future games. Though as much as I love the first three stages here, the final stage of this world is absolutely the best one of World 5. With how pitch black the darkness and the light bulb portion is, it's a fair bit more unsettling without the glow in the dark fixtures of the first light bulb segment. And to my surprise, that wasn't even the focus of the stage, because after leaving the cave, Forgotten Land goes full cinematic. It may only be me, but that part where the camera pans up at the mountains with this part's adventurous theme kicking in is one of my favorite little moments in any Kirby game. It's neat how the stages of World 5 represent time passing for Kirby as it goes from day to evening to night. Forgotten Land is filled to the brim with subtle details like that. As if that all wasn't cool enough, there's even an Archmouth segment squeezed in. Putting the one from World 2 to shame, the visuals of Kirby soaring past buried windmills and dodging crumbling hazards are nothing short of awesome. That alone makes this one of, if not my all-time favorite level in Forgotten Land. They really had to put the final goal behind the end of the stage so that it's right there in frame in the end results screen. Who hurt you, Hal? So in a natural progression following all that, it's time for Kirby to visit the local crackhead. In terms of Silly Dillo, a lot of the challenge comes with him catching you off guard your first time. However, once you get the timing down, he ends up becoming a lot easier. It was honestly harder beating DDD without taking damage for me. Now before I get to the final world, while there are still some more ability scrolls past this point, I want to look at all the upgrades this game deals out. How about I rank them? Ranking the second tiers, first at the bottom I probably put Fleur Tornado and Volcano Fire. Their decent power-ups don't get me wrong, but they're pretty much just that. No real new abilities to be had here. Despite how much I love them basing designs off mini-bosses, I had to put Volcano Fire slightly higher solely due to how much damage you can deal with it in the early game. A bit higher and there's Pencil Drill. Alongside a cute design, and now jumping out of the ground sends damaging pencils out with you. Makes Drill as a whole way more viable for fights in my opinion, though in terms of the cuteness factor, Frost Frosty Ice can't be beat with it allowing Kirby to create little snow frosties that freeze any enemy on contact. A much needed improvement to Ice's somewhat bland base form. Not enough to top Chakram Cutter however, as in a serious glow up, this upgrade allows you to spam multiple cutters. It can be somewhat daunting to control at first I'll admit, but once you get the hang of that chaos, it becomes so fun. Next there's Cluster Needle, which I'll be upfront about, is only this high due to the Kirby 64 reference. I mean come on, isn't that great? I'm so glad they brought back the insane design of Double needle. Its extra little debris that hurt enemies are a nice touch too. Right by that is Noble Ranger with its absolutely adorable getup for Kirby. He's got his little pirate hat and everything. In terms of gameplay, while not at its peak yet, this is when Ranger starts to shine more. And in an upgrade I really didn't see coming, above that there's Chain Bomb. Now, whenever you're setting up a minefield to obliterate the enemy, bombs that are close to each other will link up, creating an even stronger explosion when triggered. Seriously, what a creative way to improve such a simple ability. So with the top two of the second tier, I had to put Gigant Sword followed by Toy Hammer. Not only does Gigant Sword come with more range, it even gets a broken guard. Except as a downside to both of those, its attacks are also more sluggish and it can't dodge, which personally keeps it from being number one. Then with Hammer, be honest, you're gonna tell me you don't love this design? It packs a punch as well, that sound effect that plays when you hit enemies being really satisfying. Though when it comes to all of those, they're merely setting the stage for the tier 3 upgrades of Forgotten Land. At the bottom this time, there's Blizzard Ice and Twin Drill. Again, fine abilities, but compared to the others, their upgrades are probably the least crazy. I'll admit, Twin Drill does have a slight edge over Ice with its dig now damaging enemies. Crystal Needle and Storm Tornado are also in the same boat, they just both look really cool. Storm Tornado is a fun one in particular with how massive the tornado attack becomes. Next, Enhancing Bomb even further, there's Homing Bomb, where all the while keeping the chain mechanics, your bombs will also chase enemies. And in what I'm sure will shock all of you, above that for me is Wild Hammer. I know, crazy that Hammer isn't my default 
default favorite like it is in most Kirby games, but this one is a bit more mid. Similar to Gigant Sword, it's another slow yet strong type of ability, only this one doesn't have that broken guard. I enjoyed it, don't get me wrong, these next ones just become way more insane. Like Dragonfire with its incredible range and aerial attack. Coming from someone who'd always spam this attack in every Kirby game, this ability was the best. Somehow crazier than that, there's Buzzsaw Cutter, the peak of this ability out of every Kirby game. Alongside all the other good aspects of 3D Cutter, the ricochet potential of this one practically breaks any fight with walls. Though in terms of the final two best tier 3 abilities, I've got to give it to Meta Knight Sword and Space Ranger. I'm sure you don't even need me to tell you why Meta Knight Sword is 100% amazing. Everything about it, from the guard slash combo to its little Meta Knight flares, are what I wanted out of 3D Kirby abilities. In fact, the only reason Space Ranger ranks slightly higher is how much I abused its charge attack and counter. If you time it right, it can really melt any fight in a flash. Oh, and before I forget, aren't there two other abilities in Forgotten Land? Surely those didn't get upgraded. Well, not only did they, but Hal made them god tier. With Sleep's upgrade Deep Sleep, Kirby gets to sleep in a proper bed for once. Don't wake up too soon, by the way, because if you let Kirby get his 8 hours, both all his health is recovered and a random bonus effect is applied. Just imagine getting this one in the arena's random abilities. Then, reigning supreme at the top as one of the coolest abilities ever created in all of Kirby, there's Time Crash. Clearly having just watched a certain show, Time Crash is still a one-time ability that destroys enemies, and no changes there. The main difference is on use, Time Crash slows down time to a near standstill, this effect getting extended the more damage you deal to bosses or enemies. Instead of fighting them every game, and now Kirby's become the Ultra Horror, tearing apart the very fabric of reality just so that he can get that one Awoofy in the distance. This is what I meant when I emphasized the variety in this game before. It's like they give you just enough time to get used to an ability before all of a sudden handing you its upgrade. Feel free to let me know your rankings down in the comments. So with all that taken care of, let's head to Forgotten Land's final world. Cranking up the notch from abandoned civilization to full-on apocalypse with this lava-themed world, that little cutscene at the start of the first stage sets the tone immediately. There's definitely been cinematic moments like this before in Kirby, but I really love how much Forgotten Land leans into it. As far as the actual stages go, the first two are solid lava stages, nothing too crazy about them. It's the third stage where this world really captivated me, with Hal proving yet again that they alone are the masters of factory levels. Seriously, it's crazy how they somehow keep topping themselves with these. In fact, I think it may even be tied with the last stage for my favorite stage of this world, not to discount the one after this, of course. I was pretty surprised to see the end of game boss rush actually be a stage before the final one of the game. That roller coaster segment put me on the edge of my seat. Then, in the last normal level of the game, we've hit the Beast Pack's last stand. Where the level before this was kind of a boss rush, I'd call this one an enemy rush, with just about every Beast Pack enemy you've seen trying to stop Kirby however they can. You really get the sense that they've grown truly desperate as they try to overcome Kirby through sheer numbers, only to be utterly trounced. Glad they fit in one last Archmouth segment here, they're all so good. Thus, after that, all that's left is to save Elphalan and stop the Beast Pack for good. Except now that I think about it, wasn't there one other thing I've been holding back from talking about? Oh yeah, it's music time! Outside of me slipping a bit with DDD, I've been purposely holding back from mentioning this game's music until now, as if I was, I would have been interrupting the review every minute to gush about how wonderfully crafted every song of this soundtrack is. From the moment you boot up the game to the last gotcha you get, it's absolutely perfect the whole way through. And before I talk about the individual tracks I especially loved, I feel it's important to shine a spotlight on the game's four composers. You heard me right, we're up to four with this game. Let me explain, usually in Kirby we've got the two composers who've been with the series since the beginning, Jun Ishikawa, the first Kirby composer, and Hirokazu Ando who joined in Kirby's Adventure. They're both incredibly talented and continue to create truly incredible pieces. Although in this game, they didn't compose the majority of the soundtrack. Instead, Hal has begun to shine the spotlight on two newcomers that from the get-go are already equally matched with the Kirby veterans. First appearing in Star Allies, there's Yuta Ogasawara. Back in that game, the really notable song he composed was Planet Earthfall's theme, one of the best stage themes from Star Allies in my opinion. Though outside of that and a few others, he was mostly delegated to sound effect work. While that absolutely changed in Forgotten Land, because clearly realizing his talent, Hal let him lose to compose such hits as this game's Meta Knight theme and 
DDD theme to name a few. Interestingly enough, his style is almost like a mix between Ando and Ishikawa, and next to him, there's the even newer composer, Yuki Shimooka. Being extremely fresh to Kirby, having only done some work on Kirby Fighters 2 and the Kirby Cafe, it came as a great surprise to me that he composed the most songs out of the four. Seeing as he was the one behind the new Shadow Kirby theme, Hal clearly realized his talent fast. His compositional style, while Ando-esque at times, has a great deal of variety to it, so I'm looking forward to seeing his distinct sound develop in the coming games. It's an all-star team that's kind of emblematic of this game's mixing of the old and the new. If you want to see for yourself who composed what, pay attention to the colors of the music notes in the sound test. Though going back a bit, I need to talk about that Meta Knight theme before anything else. There's so much I love about this theme, so why don't I start with the fact that Jazzy Meta Knight better be a Kirby mainstay from here on. That saxophone guitar combo that sticks around for the first half of the song works so well both musically and for the fight it's backing. Because with this being an optional fight against a Meta Knight that's not being manipulated in any way, it's like a duel against friends. While Meta Knight is serious about testing his strength, the two clearly share a camaraderie that's been built up over the years. And this song absolutely reflects that, its upbeat jazz combined with intense rock representing those two sides of this duel to me. But of course, that's just the build-up to what I'm sure you already know is my favorite part, when the song starts trickling in and my friend in the setting sun. It's a really cool decision on Oga Sawara's part to only play part of the leitmotif twice before going all in with it. It's as if those events of Revenge of Meta Knight happened so long ago that both Kirby and Meta Knight can't even fully remember it anymore. Though when it fully kicks in that third time, well, just listen for yourself. What an outstanding song! It's easily the best theme Meta Knight's ever had, and it sets a pretty high bar for any more to come. However, with that and the DDD theme, those two make up most of this game's Kirby remixes, as for the first time in over a decade, Forgotten Land has a nearly entirely original soundtrack devoid of remixes. Which, as much as I love the musical fanservice of recent years, is a decision I'm honestly fine with. Star Allies has satiated me for now and then some in that regard, so jumping to World 3 past some honorable mentions like Alival Mall and Abandoned Beach, the theme of the House of Horrors is so groovy. Junishikawa may not have composed much this time around, but damn if he can't churn out bangers whenever he's needed. Despite the lack of remixes, the spirit of older soundtracks are very much alive, due in part to Ishikawa's distinct sound. And moving on from the 80s, the winter world, like most Kirby games, came complete with fantastic tunes. Not just one, either. All three of these have quickly become the new gold standard for me in terms of snowy Kirby themes. I'm sorry, Aurora Area, you'll always have a special place in my heart. Like, seriously, Seriously, that first track combined the melancholic feel of an abandoned city with the majesty of its snowy landscape so well. I've come to appreciate this part at the end with the guitar and strings more and more. It's so nice they used it twice, but I don't want to take away any attention from the others, as the upbeat Metro theme and the complex jazzy theme of the bridge are both superb. That bridge theme in particular is right next to the first one as a standout for the entire game. Ando's got his jazz fusion down to a T. Next in the desert world, filling the shoes of my last favorite Kirby desert, Gigabyte Grounds, the newest composer out of the four, stepped in here to produce another all-time favorite of mine. Remember when I praised the fourth level for its cinematic transition outside the light bulb segment? Well, I briefly mentioned it, but the theme that kicks in there is out of this world. Its exciting, adventurous sound complements this part perfectly, as Kirby braves the harsh canyon on his quest to save Velphalin. That gliding segment was made ten times better by it, for sure. Major props to Yuki Shimooka. Love the intense theme from the first level, too. It really fits the harsh sandstorm sweeping a former seabed. Then in the final world with its factory, of course they got Ishikawa to back it. Despite literally composing half a soundtrack of purely mechanical themes, it's great seeing how he can still control continue topping himself. That moment when the harsh intro gives way to lighter synths is my favorite part by far.
This man really is just an endless reservoir of bopping melancholic factory themes. The final stages theme is great too. Love how chaotic it gets as if to represent all the animals making their last stand. So there, that'll be my big ramble for this game's soundtrack. Hope it wasn't too long. With how much I love this soundtrack, I really felt I needed to cover it as properly as I could. Don't worry, there's still a few more songs I'll go into later. Really hope Nintendo doesn't strike me for the song snippets I've been showing. I just can't not show examples for some of these wonderful tunes. Regardless, with that taken care of, let's kick off Forgotten Land's finale with a new Masked DDD fight. Complete with a new rendition of the theme in a second phase, this fight is a crazy fun combination of classic DDD attacks with his new feral fighting style. I feel like this is kind of payback for me, always spamming up B with DDD and Smash. And from here on, while the story's been a pretty standard affair for the most part, Hal decides to take things from a chill 1 to a chaotic 1000, but not before giving DDD one of the best scenes he's ever had in any game. And Entering Lab Discovera, Forgotten Land comes out swinging with a shock of real spoken voice acting. Not the fake language stuff from the beginning, I'm talking full on sentences in whichever language your Switch is set to. Kirby usually has a tendency to drop everything at the end of the game, but it's never been this insane. It's cool how if you immediately walk through the hallway after getting there, the voice acting is timed perfectly to last right up until you go through the door. This craziness only continues too, with the leader of the Beast Pack, Leongar, saying some pretty funny stuff. While it was a pretty Pretty prolific joke before release that Elphalyn was gonna betray Kirby, I really didn't see this angle coming as Hal instead made Elphalyn an actual piece of the antagonist. So in the ensuing Leongar fight, this is another one where the size disparity between him and Kirby made him pretty intimidating. His wide sweeping attacks in the first half aren't the worst, but in the second half where he becomes totally not possessed, this fight really comes into its own. Love how this game continues the Kirby trend of hiring veteran voice actors to make screams and grunts, which for Leongar, I will say are done pretty well. In his possessed phase, the attack where he vomits out a massive laser beam clearly causes the poor guy a lot of pain. It's a bit hard to hear over the sound of the laser, but his screams when he does it are intense. Though that's nothing compared to what's coming up when the funky fetus who's been controlling him awakens and absorbs everything in sight. There's always that joke where Kirby games get way darker than you'd expect, but wow, this is going past that and straight into full-on horror. As a fight, Facto Forgo is pretty simple admittedly, as it only really has two attacks. It's the visuals of this gooey alien amalgamation of all the animals it's absorbed that truly makes this a fight to remember. Thank god this hallway was so long. And despite all that, defeating Fecto Forgo was all for naught as it still managed to absorb Elphalyn. Now you'll have to excuse me if this goes on for a bit, because up ahead now is in my opinion one of the best final bosses Kirby's ever had. Ascending up to the helipad at the top of the tower, Fecto Forgo, reunited with her lost half, becomes Fecto Elphalus. Wow, what an incredible design that is. It really sells the fact that it's an ultimate life form considering it doesn't even need to be some hulking beast to destroy you. Since fitting that design, Effecto Elphilus excels the most in speed, going back and forth between the arena and the distant background to attack you. Sometimes it'll teleport behind you all the while spears from the distance are still flying towards Kirby. There's really nothing better than dodging his various spear attacks, whether they be in quick succession or charging at you from the sky. Most of all, the great variety of attacks Fecto can throw at you keeps you on your toes. Some attacks like their Slashes growing in power further into the fight. Those meteorites were by far its scariest attack to avoid. After getting a taste of how cool Kirby final bosses can be in a 3D space in the last game, they really mastered it here. It may not entail any crazy segments in the main fight like Robobot or Star Allies, but I'm kind of fine with that. For the first Kirby 3D platformer, I feel it's only fitting that the final boss be fought normally without any extra gimmicks. Though for me, what elevated this fight above so many was its godlike theme. Adding to another of Hirokazu on those brilliant final boss themes, there's so much to gush about here. To fit with the overall design and graceful attacks of Fecto Elphilus, the first half of the song bears a strong violin focus with a sight of piano. It makes the fight almost feel like a complicated dance between two evenly matched opponents. When the main melody kicks in after that wonderful minute-long build-up, that was when I knew this would become one of my favorites. <laughs> Thank you. 
However, that's only the first half. After a bit of a transitional part that features some suspiciously familiar organ progression, the last two or so minutes of this piece are where it goes all in. Now, as Fecto Elphilus's health is below half, this far more bombastic and upbeat portion to me shows the ultimate life form throwing everything they have to defeat their pink adversary. And on the flip side, this part being more upbeat also kind of represents Kirby's realization that Fecto Elphilus isn't some invincible god. But by far, what deserves the most praise here is the chorus that takes center stage. Age. Showing up here and there in the earlier parts of the song, Ando let it loose in this final portion, leading to this part sounding absolutely magnificent. Especially towards the end, where there's this one portion I feel you all should hear before I even begin to praise it. I don't know, man, that part makes me feel things. The sheer beauty of it all with that added sad twinge almost makes me feel like it represents Fecto's pain after being trapped all those eons. Since despite it being shown to be a generally vile creature with no regard for life at all, even an uncaring god can suffer. It's exceedingly rare that any song makes my eyes well up, and this song definitely joined to those select few. I'll take to the streets if this doesn't win best soundtrack of the year. An interesting thing I learned while writing this is to avoid the song just looping in full or jarringly switching to different parts as you beat Fecto, there's actually many little transition pieces put into the game. Due to this, no matter what part of the song is playing, it'll smoothly go to the next part as you continue fighting. It's not over yet either, because once you mouthful mode Elphalin out of Fecto, they throw the last of their power into ensuring Kirby loses everything. I'll be frank, I've come to terms with the fact that there may never be a Kirby ending quite as hype as him channeling the Giga Drill Breaker. However, the one thing I never accounted for was Truck. Incorporating the game's gimmick in at the last second, this final push to stop Fecto was out of this world. Just the insane scenery of the two planets beginning to rip each other apart as they approach the Roche limit and Kirby taking advantage of that to drive towards Fecto is genuinely stunning. It wouldn't have shocked me if Fecto cast Supernova at this point. And man, the decision to back this part with a remix of the Invincibility theme, what a great choice. There's nothing more hype than using a theme that's been around since the beginning to enforce that Kirby in this moment is truly unstoppable. Thus, after power through quick time events to reach a melting Fecto, Kirby and Elphalin utilize the power of Truck to obliterate the Space Twink. Though now, like in every modern Kirby game, we're not done yet. Even if you've beaten every treasure road and saved every Waddle Dee, there's still this game's extra mode in arenas. But before I talk about them, let's stay in the village for a second. After all, I haven't talked about Forgotten Land sub-games yet. Ranging from painful to perfect, I'll start in the middle with Kirby's minimum wage. Being a simple test of observation and reaction time, all this boils down to is figuring out what the Waddle Dees want as fast as you can. Except when compared to Tilt and Roll Kirby, that's nothing. Literally bringing Tilt and Tumble back as a minigame, this made me realize why I've never gone back to play that game after my first run through it. I'm sure there's people out there that got these done fast, but especially the harder mode for this minigame drove me to drink. Good thing there's the fishing pond to balance things out, as finally after ten and a half years, there's a new Kirby fishing minigame. World needs saving, and Eldritch Horror is planning to consume all? That's a real shame, because nothing gets in the way of fishing. Like Help Wanted, it's another simple one, with it coming down to precise button presses. It became oddly addicting trying to catch the biggest fish in the pond. Good thing, too, because you'll need those coins for gotcha. Anyways, back on track, let's talk about that extra mode. However, calling it an extra mode here isn't exactly accurate anymore, since unlike the others, this one is 100% canon. Not even going into the crazy stuff this affects, I'm really glad they're continuing to make these segments just straight up post-game instead of what-if scenarios. And like other extra modes, at its core, this one is pretty similar, with Kirby going through the levels of the game again. Only what makes this one stand out to me is taking its setting and side effecto's dream dimension into consideration, the way each stage is slightly altered as if in a warped dream was so cool. In some instances, it felt like these were practically new stages altogether, some of them actually being entirely new. How is the absolute best for letting you know when you've gotten all the collectibles in an area before moving on? Or if you do still miss one, letting you know how many you missed in an area when you return? I love the quality of life improvements in this game. Plus man, that lighting aesthetic 
music here is great. Never knew I needed Vaporwave Tropic Woods. What a neat way to justify levels and bosses being harder as you go through them again. I mean that when it comes to the bosses too. All of them were made considerably more challenging here to the point that some managed to take me down. Underestimating Phantom Gory Mondo was the last mistake I ever made. Not to mention the music in this mode are all top tier bangers. In the one that plays for the majority of the levels, it's actually an arrangement of a live mall utilizing the minor key, which took me a second to realize. Though with the other theme later on, I'll be honest, it's been a long time since I've popped off this hard. Remember how I said before that outside of the themes of returning characters, there's really barely any Kirby remixes to be had in Forgotten Land? Well, it's almost as if they made it that way solely to have this track shock you more as Ondo squeezes in a remix of Another Dimension from Return to Dreamland. Talk about nostalgia, seeing what was one of, if not my all-time favorite stage theme from that game, Return Here, was the best surprise ever. Considering Jun Ishikawa originally composed it, seeing Ando's take on the song was really cool. What a fitting place for it too, who would have thought that song would work so well for the final portion of Forgo Dreams. Then coming up on the end of the mode, we're confronted with the scariest hallway in all of Kirby. It almost feels like they put real spoken sentences in this game purely so they could make this part as creepy as possible. And as if things haven't already been pretty different from the main story, this part puts the crazy train on full throttle. Because where it looks like you'll be fighting this game's soul boss after taking down a stronger possessed Liangar, a familiar butterfly flutters onto the battlefield. Uh, are we fighting- are we fighting it in this form? What's happening now? Well, I guess we are. Psychic Beast Soul Forgo- oh, there it is. <gasps> oh, wait a second. No, 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 that's right, Morpho Knight is back. Now crazy lore aside, the original Morpho Knight fight never really stuck out to me that much. It had some interesting mechanics, but nothing that surpassed Galactonite in my eyes. Well, let's just say that's no longer the case, since Morpho Knight here is an awesome battle. It's like all their moves in the last game were meant for 3D this whole time, the massive swords and tornadoes being especially wild. They even somehow made its friend stealing move even more evil, with it now tilting the screen to an obscene amount if you're hit by it. Same thing goes for its theme. Whereas before it was very low-key and mysterious to match the vibe of Morpho's first appearance, the Kirby fanbase at large knows Morpho Knight all too well now. So to match that, this remix goes harder than most. Ogasawara cannot stop putting out incredible tracks. I wouldn't be surprised if they gave him the next final boss theme. I'm really glad this little mode gave proper closure to Liangar and the Beast Pack. They deserve it. Easily the best extra mode in Kirby's so far. Although real quick before the arenas, there's actually two more ability upgrades to be had here. Both totally broken, there's Mask Hammer and Morpho Sword. Taking on many characteristics of Forgo DDD, it's just so cool being able to dual wield hammers. Charging that fire hammer can absolutely melt enemies if you land enough. The added fire tornadoes give hammers some nice range too, as if it wasn't already OP. And even more than that, there's the incredibly complex Morpho Sword. You thought Maglor and Star Allies was broken? You ain't seen nothing yet. Bearing the most attacks out of any copy ability in Forgotten Land, Morpho Sword not only has incredible strength, it can also absorb health and vanish for its dodge. Those two alone absolutely break this game. The fact that you can do most of its attacks after you enlarge the swords is so insane. Perfect timing too, because it's time for this game's true arena, the Ultimate Cup Z. Or well, perfect for everyone but me, since like always, I had to beat this without an ability at least once. After getting a run done with Space Ranger, something I really didn't expect is you can actually retry fights that you lose. The star coin cost to retry goes up every time, but it's quite the drastic change compared to all the other boss rushes that need to be done in one go. Regardless, for my no ability runs, I still limited them to no retries for tradition's sake. While still not topping the true arena of Robobot or the hardest difficulty of the ultimate choice, Forgotten Land's Ultimate Cup Z is a solid challenge. Mostly filled with the harder versions of fights from Forgo Dreams, that new harder Meta Knight battle was a nice surprise. I honestly feel like it dealt more damage to me than most of the fights here. Though like always, it's the new form of the final battle that poses the biggest threat. Instead of merely having stronger attacks in the first phase like most other modified Kirby final bosses, Chaos Elphilus felt like it had a nearly complete new set of attacks on top of the stronger old ones. It may as well be a new fight from the get-go with how sudden and fast these new attacks are. That tornado especially always managed to get me at least once. But of course, with more attacks come more opportunities to dodge, and you better believe I took advantage of that. Half of the time to my detriment, admittedly. It felt so cool avoiding every one of its lunges as it went in and out of portals. And 
that's only the beginning. After its health goes below half, the fight straight up becomes a 14 trial. Don't let it intimidate you too much, as long as you keep an eye on it and the spear attacks, it's not that bad to dodge. What was a nightmare were those meteorite attacks. I don't know if it was the shockwave they create or the split second they come crashing down, that was the only other attack I could never get the hang of. Didn't expect Hal to bring back Maglor's portal attack. Glad my return to Dreamland knowledge is still useful. However, hasn't there been a distinct lack of orbs in this game? Sure, DDD's on its way to becoming one, but at this rate, how can we call this a Kirby game without an orb fight? Well, Chaos Ophelis has you covered with its enigmatic third phase. Consisting of multiple orbs orbiting the being's core, this is the one bonus true arena phase that can actually be easier without an ability. Why's that? Well, if you still make sure to avoid attacks, those orbs are fair game to inhale. And since they're what attack you half the time, it's a pretty good way to cripple the boss. At least when it's not going full soul mode on you. Like the Maglor attack before, it's so crazy seeing all these iconic attacks fully realized in 3D. It may be easy to avoid, but the Drossia bounce in 3D is incredibly daunting. Looking back, I feel so stupid for not immediately realizing that you need to climb the debris to avoid its fire charge. I hope I'm not alone in that. So once I finally got this done without an ability, it only took me three tries in total, which is definitely less than what Robobots took me last month. Still a solid true arena all around. Love how in making it canon, it serves as a good resolution for the game's storyline. In turn, if you've already poured your life savings into Gotcha, that's about it for Kirby and the Forgotten Land. In stark contrast to Star Allies releasing partially completed with the game requiring free patches to make whole, Forgotten Land is about as fully realized as you can get. Outside of those incredibly minor gripes from earlier, there's not a single real complaint I have with the game. Glad they managed to squeeze in some multiplayer with Bandana Waddle Dee. I've already gushed plenty about the intricacies of it all, but just to emphasize, they put so much love into this game that the mini-boss rush on the bridge has an entirely optional harder route you can take. Only reason I found that out was due to my Twitch chat. Shout out to all of them. Whenever devs put actual thought and effort into something so easily missable like that, you know they truly cared about the game they were making. When I initially beat the main story, I was honestly kind of bummed out. While that ending left me incredibly hyped, the fact that there wasn't much game left was truly bittersweet. Forgotten Land absolutely joins the exclusive group of games I wish I could go through blind all over again. I couldn't ask for a better 30th anniversary. Although, isn't there one aspect of this game I haven't really covered at all? Oh yeah, that's spicy lore. Well, you can put those angry comments on hold because I haven't forgotten. In fact, there's so much I want to talk about when it comes to this game's lore that I decided to make an entirely separate video on it rather than cramming everything into this review. It's not done yet at the time of this upload, but believe me, I'm gonna try to get this done as soon as possible. Feel free to check out the VODs of my playthrough in the meantime. To make sure you see my new lore video the second it releases, consider subscribing here and following me on Twitter. Those really are the best ways you can stay up to date with when my videos go out. It's gonna be a doozy. Anyways, after going through Forgotten Land entirely and then some, it's clear that this is without a doubt the return to Dreamland of the new Kirby era. Not only does it make drastic changes to the very core of the series, it introduces tons of stuff that I feel will become Kirby staples from here on out. Crazily enough, this is technically the final Kirby game to build off of the failures of Kirby's cancelled GameCube games. From here on, we're heading into truly uncharted territory, and to be frank, I can't wait. Who knows what upcoming 3D Kirby games will bring? The only thing I know for sure is seeing how great Hal did on their first try, we're in for a wild ride. To those who've continued to help out the channel, I'd like to give my heartfelt thanks to Nathan and everyone else who's decided to contribute. You guys are the best. If you want to help me continue making unnecessarily massive videos like these and receive a special thank you amongst a lot of other bonus stuff, do check out my Patreon, link in the description. Wow, this video became way longer than I thought it would. I'm not entirely sure since recency bias is very real, but Forgotten Land may be my new favorite Kirby game. Like yeah, I do think there's moments in other Kirby games that have the edge on this game, but the vast amount of gameplay improvements here tip the scale in its direction, if only slightly. At the end of the day, most mainline Kirby games are so great it's like trying to pick your favorite child, so saying one or the other is your favorite doesn't amount to much. Now on to making that lore video. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.